distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Brother Friars, I thought they were saving me for the Georgie Price dinner. <laughs> and Jack, uh, thank you very much. Jack and I meet about every Sunday at one of these things. <laughs> Exchange tums. We have played so many dinners. We're at all the dinners, Benny and myself, Jessel. People are afraid to call Dave Chasen anymore. We come with the catering now. <laughs> we should organize. We can get car fare, too, you know. <laughs> but I, like all these other fellas, are very, I'm very thrilled to be here, ladies and gentlemen. You know, they've given everybody, practically everybody in the Friars a dinner, and they've finally gotten down to our guest of honor. I understand that uh, in a couple of weeks they're giving a testimonial snack to the men's room attendant. We have to give Georgie a dinner. This is the only way any of us has a chance to speak. <laughs> George grabs at any opportunity to speak. In fact, I heard he was Toastmaster at his own bris. <laughs> Pat, you and I are the only ones that don't understand that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's thank you. Barney Dean slipped that under my door this morning. <laughs> but I want to tell you that I think it's wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, they give this 20th century producer and 19th century vaudevillian a dinner. <laughs> Out of 20th century, anybody's a producer with a croquet mallet. But that's not true of Georgie. Georgie is a key man out there. He's a key man. Anytime Daryl goes to the washroom, Jessel hands him the key. <laughs> but he is, he's a wonderful guy. He really is. And uh, from the start of Georgie's career, you, you knew that he was destined for greatness. It was obvious that nothing could stop him, not even his talent. <laughs> Just take a look at him. 40 years in show business, he hasn't got a gray hair in his head. Well, he didn't have this afternoon. <laughs> he's a wonderful fellow. He really is, and he's a very... He's the... Uh, 40 years... He's the youngest of the Cantor, Jolts, and Jessel trio. He's been in the business 40 years, and he's the youngest. Before him, it was Cantor, Jolson, and Shakespeare. <laughs> But he really goes back a long way, he really does. I, he can go, he can remember way back when they were trying to get MacArthur to go over. <laughs> I could really stand up here and say a lot of things about Georgie, but he has, he's had quite a career. This man who is sometimes referred to as the Anthony Eden of Pico Boulevard. <laughs> the kosher Errol Flynn. <laughs> He really is a great sentimentalist, and he cried like a baby the other day when Truman made that speech about the draft. Georgie thought they were taking girls from 18 to 25. <laughs> he doesn't give a second thought to women. His first thought covers everything. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to report tonight that he doesn't chase women as much as he used to. He had his desk sawed in half so he could take a shortcut. <laughs> he's a wonderful guy. He's a very loyal fellow. He's crazy about his boss, Zanuck. The other night at the Academy Award, when Daryl bent over to kiss the Oscar, Jessel bent over and kissed Zanuck. <laughs> it was a pretty sight. I can't tell you what he does to keep his job, but it's banned in Boston. Man of great talent, of course. We can't forget that Georgie sings, too. A lot of people try, but it's not true that he's the original voice of the turtle. 
I've only known, I've only known Georgie, I think, personally for about 15 years. And I feel rather unfortunate not knowing him long before that. Because since I've known him, I've received many, many a lift just from his wonderful wit and personality. This guy is loaded with ability. Loaded with that talent to make people laugh. He's a great man mentally and spiritually. Physically, nature knocked with 10 points. <laughs> but he's got a very, very big heart for that body. And whenever he's working on a cause that he really believes in, he talks like a much taller man. He really does. He's a great guy. He's gonna have many, many more tributes like this in the future because he's got the energy, the ability, and the personality to go on and on, and I hope so, and I hope I'm invited. Thank you. Everybody is doing too well tonight to suit me. I want to take back one thing that I said about Hope, about his being unselfish. The reason I'm taking that back is because about two years ago, I had to do a broadcast with Bob. We were on a program together. We did a spot together, a 15 minute spot for a benefit and Hope's writers wrote this particular spot with the result that Hope had all the jokes and I had all the straight lines. Matter of fact, I had so many straight lines that when I finally got to a joke, I read it like a question. <laughs> Incidentally, I heard a wonderful line the other day about the difference between Jessel, Cantor, and Jolson. I don't know whether you heard or not. So the Jolson has five million dollars. Cantor would like to have five million dollars, and Jessel doesn't want Cantor to have it. <laughs> what a difference between three people. That I never heard before. Such a thing I never heard in my life before. And I, you didn't say, you didn't yeah, say that. God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I started to say, ladies and gentlemen, if Georgie Jessel were introducing our next speaker, he would probably start out something like this. Like, despite the urgency of laissez-faire, <laughs> this man promised he would come, and he's here. But promises are like the robes of Penelope. <laughs> Woven in the morning, unraveled at night. Now, Jessel himself wouldn't know what that meant. But neither would we, so we would immediately give him credit for being a brilliant scholar. <laughs> Jessel reminds me of a show I saw two years ago in New York, Skin of Our Teeth. Nobody understood it, so they gave it the Pulitzer Prize. You know, it's the same thing with him. Mayor Barn, it isn't often that I ask a favor of a city official, but right in front of NBC there on the curb, there's a long stretch of curb painted red there that I wish you could have removed so it would accommodate more cars there. Three times this year I've had to go into a parking lot there. <laughs> would help just a little bit in there, Carson. <laughs> Our next guest is always introduced as the world's greatest entertainer, and of course he is. And his return to show business 
after his many years of retirement has been nothing short of sensational. And very much, she's very, very much like Georgie Jessel. Well, he's a ladies' man. Anyway, they grow up and become ladies. That's one thing about it. So I was very happy to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Al Jolson. Tonight, you are looking at the goose who's going to lay the golden egg. Why I am brought at this ungodly hour to tell jokes or to make any speech, I don't know. I haven't any speech. I haven't any writers to write me jokes. But I'm proud of one thing that I'm standing up here and I'm able to say things about Jessel. Outside of Cantor, who I'm glad left me out with the idea of Georgie saying something about my death. <laughs> and I know he's still mad at me about the jazz singer. <laughs> and Jessel, well, always imitated me. Stole my jokes. Stole my women. Or tried to. I remember quite a few years ago, Georgie, when I was in this town, I was going with a certain girl, what her name is, I won't mention. She wasn't a chink. him too, you know that. But no matter what girl I went after, Georgie went after it too. And this girl was playing at the United Artists Theater doing some kind of an act at vaudeville there at the time. And uh, he knew that I was going with her. He was pretty well stuck on her. But he knocked on the door and the girl said, who is there? And he said, I'm rock a bar you. And she let him in. I never saw her after that. <laughs> but Georgie has a happy faculty of going around and making jokes about people. They're very cute and all that now. At, uh, of course, I resent that uh, crack, uh, Mr. Benny, about me having $5 million. I really have seven. <laughs> so if I flop here, then I don't mean a damn thing. I know, Harry Cohen, Harry Cohen is sitting down here, Louis Mayer is up here. They both want me after tonight, nobody will want me. But Jessel always had a happy faculty of telling jokes, and just lately, he was in New York playing a saloon, I forget the name of the place, and at that time, a lot of columnists had things in the paper about how I wasn't getting along so good with Larry Parks. So Jessel got out on the floor. What was the name of the place you played, Georgie? The Carnival. Got on the floor and he says, it's a lie. Just so he says, Jolson and Parsa get along great. He says, not only do they get along great, but not long ago, he says, Jolson invited Parks out to his home in Malibu and took him swimming, tried to teach him how to drown. <laughs> I got $5 million. I'm older than Jessel, old in Canada. I want to pay tribute to Jessel, and uh, while he tried to sing like me for the last 30 years, he n I never, that flatness, you know, that I, I never could get, but... <laughs> this is a hell of a time to flop, but anyway. <laughs> but Georgie always sang his song, and then he went into a bit of a patter. Martin, will you just play My Mother's Eyes, please? <clears throat> One bright and guiding light That taught me wrong from right I found in my mother's eyes Those 
baby tale she told The road all paved with gold I found in my mother's eyes Just like a wandering sparrow One lonely night I walked the straight and narrow reach my goal God's gift sent from above a real unselfish love I found in my my mother's eyes my mother's eyes How different, how different things are today than they were many years ago. Well, I remember years ago, we didn't have joints like Ciro's Macambos or the loud noise of music. You'd walk in a little place in New York like Luchow's. They had a string quartet, a couple of violins, a cello and bass and a piano. And they'd play beautiful things like well, on the banks of the Wabash, an old sweetheart of mine. Today, they play bongo, bongo, bongo. I don't want to go back to the Congo, flatfoot floozy. And you took a girl out in those days, didn't cost you a million dollars. You sat down, listened to the beautiful music, and out of your hip pocket, you took a little flask, and the Jane had a glass, and as you started to pour the liquor in a glass, you said to her, say when. And she said, right after we have this drink, honey. <laughs> God's gift sent from above a real unselfish love I found in my mother. This is a little song you never heard. 
I want you to listen to a new song. I wrote it about a little kid I adopted a few weeks ago. Nearest thing to heaven is that rippling sunny smile. The nearest thing to heaven is to hold him for a while and feel those tiny little hands pulling at my tie. How he laughs when he rumples my hair and pokes his little finger in my eye. Nearest thing to heaven are those rosy apple cheeks. I've learned to understand him every time he speaks and just like his mommy is everything divine nearer thing to heaven is that little Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, Mr. Benny has a few words that I'd like to say about something very, very important. Please, I, uh, it's awfully wonderful, if you know that, to let an old guy like me come up in and even sing three songs. And uh, I want to tell you, next time I'll prepare with some jokes, Bob. Jack, will you get in there? God bless you, get in there. Go. You know, only in our business do you remain so young. The fact. The fella Jolson, nearly 60. Cantor, 55. Burns, 51. Jessel, 50. Put them all together, you got to force them at Hillcrest. I mean, that's my thing. I'll be 40 my next birthday myself. I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know of anyone more worthy of this tribute tonight than our guest of honor. We've waited a long time to do this, but probably it's because we would rather hear him talk all evening. He's celebrating his 40th year in show business. It's a great pride now that I bring you our guest of honor a man that has brought so much joy and happiness into all of our lives, Georgie Jessel. Mr. Toastmaster, Mr. Mayor, and if God forbid anything should happen, Governor, And I must modestly say that Lieutenant Governor Knight's geographical essay is the finest tribute ever paid to me that I've ever had. <laughs> this has been a most trying evening for me. <laughs> Listening to many gentlemen, highly successful in their own vocations, attempting to be after dinner speakers. <laughs> And considering this great fund of inexperience, <laughs> they've done remarkably well, and I compliment them. As I would compliment a 60-year-old baseball umpire who has crocheted his first tablecloth. <laughs> Most men, 
our recipients of a testimonial dinner such as this are immediately overcome with emotion when called to their feet. And let me begin a hesitant address by saying, oh, my friends, I have no words at this time. I have more words than in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> and as to the praises and the many shafts that have been wafted at me by most of the speakers, it would be nice if I were overcome by the close proximity of these celebrated people. Unfortunately, I'm not. <laughs> I don't think that posterity will be as generous as you have been with your laughter and applause to most of the speakers. <laughs> Look to your mind's eye and see what might be written of most of them in the future. A short word portrait of their career. Mr. Cantor, favorite radio star of the crystal set day. <laughs> Mr. George Burns, whose lifeline of existence is dependent upon what Gracie will say when he says, and what then happened to your brother? <laughs> Mr. Danny Kaye, current favorite of a shattered and bankrupt Great Britain. <laughs> Mr. Bob Hope, the most popular comedian of an era when America was in its most bewildered state. <laughs> Mr. Pat O'Brien of Vine Street, Parnell. <laughs> Mr. Jolson with a great success shielded from the public eye by a handsome boy in his 20s and a thousand fat Victor records. <laughs> and the Toastmaster. Every schmuck is a Toastmaster. by so many insinuations that it's about time that honor was paid to me. <laughs> this is not the first dinner in my honor by any chance. I was given a dinner by the parent club, the Friars, in 1928 at the Old Monastery in New York, and the speakers were Mrs. Cohan, Collier, Marcus Lowe, Walter Kelly, Sam Harris, Sime Sylvan, and many others who have since gone down the road to their fathers. And these gentlemen, in singing my praises, did not incorporate any monologues that they had formerly auditioned for Alexander Fantasia. <laughs> <laughs> but they spoke of the many things that I had done for humanity in general and of the great contribution I had made to mankind. And even though modesty forbids it, <laughs> It is not fair to a young lady with whom I have a date later in the evening not to hear some fine things about me. <laughs> As a child, I made up many sayings which are known the world over. A friend in need is a friend indeed, is what my <laughs> Another money you make like that will never do you any good. Rockefeller can only wear one suit at a time, was one of my friends. <laughs> and I should have been happy if the preceding speakers had mentioned the help that I had been to men throughout the years. I wish I could say this in the second or third person. <laughs> I recall walking along the waterfront in Albany many years ago and seeing a young man having trouble starting his boat. I helped him. He never forgot it. That man was Robert Fulton, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the world doesn't know this, nor did you hear it from the mouths of these speakers, of how I was called upon to Washington by a great man in the time when our country was in great hazard. When he said to me, Georgie, I don't know what to do about this general I have. He drinks, he smokes, and with his beard, people think he looks Jewish. I'm being terribly criticized. <laughs> 
And I said, Abe, keep Grant. Let McClellan go. <laughs> Only lately I've been called upon to serve my country. A publisher who lives in San Simeon sent for me some months ago <laughs> and said to me, Georgie, I have a man who I feel is right for the presidency and I want you to help him in public utterance. So while most of you think I was appearing in a carnival a saloon in New York, I was at Lowe's Tokyo, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> man, I said to him, Doug, your speeches are too flowery. You sound as if you have a godhead complex. The public don't want that. Remember, you're just a man, Doug. You're not Zanuck. <laughs> not only have I helped my fellow man, but I've helped dumb animals as well. Some years ago, I met a horse. <laughs> I'll fool around with that, a Chinese girl and a horse. Do something with that. I met this horse as a two-year-old and nobody wanted to bet on him. A thin, skinny horse, Rosenberg was his name. I made him change his name to Rosemont and he beat stage hand to win the Santa Anita Handicap. But all this is yesterday's roses. All this is clabberage in a tunnel. <laughs> More than anyone else, I think in America do I know how much bunkum there is in testimonial dinners. I have had through my years in public life to tell more lies about guests of honor than any one of my contemporaries. I have screamed their virtues from the speaker's table, hiding their vices in my own conscience. But I have found this to be true, and this is in defense of the friars giving this dinner for me. I never knew anyone who was the recipient of a testimonial dinner who didn't have some something that was pretty good, some slight decent quality. No one ever gave a dinner for Lefty or Sitting Bull. <laughs> And so, after 40 years in show business, I'm inclined to look at things philosophically. I don't know whether or not life begins at 40 or not. If it does, it begins from here up. <laughs> but the manuscript of life is a tragedy farce. There's very little mystery in it. And we know very soon to finish and we reach for our hats and our hearts. At this moment, the scene is light and gay, and for me particularly is the manuscript sweetly scented. And as the curtain rises, I find myself at this moment basking on the right side of the stage. I am not a rich man, but whatever I have is profit. All this, all this is profit. I began with nothing, not only that, after I was a few days old, they took get something away from me. <laughs> this milestone in a minstrel's career, I find myself blessed with good health and a little daughter who gives every sign of being comfort to me in the twilight years. And I'm further blessed having so many acquaintances of friends, not only here but throughout all America, but particularly these who have come tonight to break bread in this intimate scene with me. And as for myself and the manuscript, I find the part that I play is a good part. For I play a man with many faults, who makes many mistakes, and many, many speeches. I have but three cardinal virtues. I was a good son. I am a good friar. And I have good judgment in the budgeting of words, or shall we say, the art of oratory. And with that in mind, I am keenly sensed as to anticlimax. And I cornesquely pause because it is natural that a man pause at this stage of his life and think of those of close kinship 
that we want with us only at moment of compliment. And as I say that, by force of being middle-aged and sentimental, my eyes fill up. And this is a cue, and I take it. And like so, I salute these distinguished gentlemen who have said words in praise. And like so, I throw a kiss to you assembled. And like so, I sit down. for the very nice thing you said about me. <laughs> I came here with an allergy yet. Tonight. After what you said about me, it's going to be very difficult to do what I have to do at this moment, but I'm going to try. The friars have asked me to give you this little gift. It's a token of their great admiration and respect and love for you and for what you have done, not only for the club, but for everybody, everywhere. And here this is. You please accept this from the Friars Club. This is an insignia of the Friars Club, evidently gold. <laughs> and I shall treasure it and keep it with me and in my heart always, long after the Friars of today go back to Farmer Page and the Goldie Brothers. <laughs> Thank you. I got nothing at my dinner, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, mine was a stag. It was a different affair. But now, from now on, we will have dancing. This concludes this part of the entertainment. Thank you very, very much.